So um, we've just put together a little bit of background information um, in regards to our Y558 claim. Um, it was initially um, lodged on behalf of Nateda by uh, our late Uncle John Kamita. Um, and in um, 2016, was that one? Yeah, I'm pretty sure, 2016, uh, Uncle John, um, having some health concerns, um, passed that, essentially passed that uh, responsibility uh, onto Papa Te Rua, uh, Uncle Roger, Papa mm -hmm. um, In 1993, there was a, a report commissioned by Natura and it was carried out by a gentleman by the name of Brian Easton. And essentially his job was to do some research about the losses of Natira. And as you can see here, it was pretty, um, pretty huge losses <coughs> for all of us. Um, our tenora Natira Tanga, there was a loss of lands, our mountains, our forests, our, essentially our kaitiaki tanga. There was loss of uh, sources to, of food, building materials, water rights, there was a reduction in um, the population of our hapu and our iwi uh, as a result of death during hostilities. There was also the loss of um, a flour mill and schooner and capital assets. And at the time, if those of us, some of us won't be aware, um, that was essentially uh, because our tupuna Hira Te Pōpō was uh, quite the entrepreneur. He was uh, a um, well-regarded businessman, very astute. Um, there was also pollution of the air and waters. There was a loss of two commercial assets, loss of companies, loss of resource base, alienation of lands, a flour mill <coughs> owned by Nātira was burnt down. Um, it was completed in 1860 and burnt down in 1865. The value uh, now of the flour mill would be approximately 4.6 million if it still existed. Um, and during the 1865 hostilities, a schooner, Hira, owned by Nātira, was confiscated by government troops. Um, the Raupati also included 165,000 acres of confiscated land by the Crown, and it was within the Nātira rohe. So essentially what we've put together is a bit of a, um, a timeline. As I said before, uh, the Y claim was initially um, held by Uncle John Kamita. And for some of us um, will recall, essentially there was a, a Raupatu attempt back in 1993-94. I call it an attempt because it didn't go well. Obviously that didn't happen still here now. Um, but during the period between 96 and 2015, Uncle, Uncle John um, continued to have direct communications with the ministers in Parliament uh, regarding our Nātida claim. In October 2015, some of us participated in uh, the Te Tarata 150th commemorations. That was, um, that was an amazing event and um, extremely well attended. In May 2016, the was lodged with the uh, North Eastern Maritime Tribunal Inquiry and withdrawn from the Tuake structure. So Tuake was the rōpū that was initially 
being established to try and clue the, the local to claim for Whakatoria. Um, in June, November, there were a number of hui's with um, tribunal or tribunal led inquiries and meetings to try and um, unravel, if you like. There was a bit of a mess with the the Y claimants <coughs> trying to conduct their own, essentially hold on to their own claim, and the, the tuaki structure, because there was a, a, a debate had already started about who had mandate to represent our interests. By uh, January 2017, there was a meeting with the Whakatuahia Police and Claims Trust uh, regarding a petition that required the withdrawal of the Y558 claim. Um, that was ignored and quickly followed by uh, application for an urgent hearing before the Waitangi Tribunal. That was Y558 and 12 other applicants. So there were 13 applicants who wanted an urgent Waitangi Tribunal inquiry. The inquiry was about whether or not the Whakatuahia Police Settlement Claims Trust had the mandate to represent our Y claims. Because by this point, a number of us were already saying, no, you don't. Um, from the other side, they will say the Crown recognised the mandate, so they carried on with it. And that's where you get the, the conflict in views. In July 2017, Judge Savage granted an urgent hearing. Um, however, in the same year, in August, the signing of the agreement in principle was executed down in Wellington. So, for those, those of us who are still kind of learning about this, the agreement in principle is the um, substantive um, the substantive agreement around the $100 million and all. That's the bulk package, and it's the manner in which that's broken down. Um, November of last year, we ended up going to the Waitangi Tribunal Urgent Inquiry, which was held between the 6th and the 10th, and a number of us were there um, in support of our whānau. In April of this year, um, the Waitangi Tribunal Court of Inquiry was released, uh, into, and they, did a, they were doing an inquiry about whether or not the Whakatuahia Pre-Settlement Claims Trust mandate was substantial enough for the Crown to continue with negotiations. A number of us were saying it's not. The Crown was saying it was, and that's how we ended up at the inquiry. Just to simplify things, without getting too complicated. So since the, um, the report came out in April of this, this year, um, the claimants and the legal counsel and the Crown have a right of reply to that report now. Um, they've got to have it in, I think, by the 25th of May, so this month. Um, the full, unedited version of the Whakatuahe Mandate Inquiry can be found in this link. And if anybody's interested in that, just let me know and I can forward it to you. Okay. Um, there were some compelling points of evidence in that report, which included data that had been compiled uh, illustrating the difference in numbers of Udi registered with the Whakatuahia Trust Board. So there were, I believe, 9,000 um, registered with the board, but only 6,000 voting packs were dispatched. So that was roughly about 3,000 unaccounted registrations. 3,000 people never got How the same. Um, user can if everyone can only get to the console? Like, isn't that part of it? So this is where, this is, uh, and that will come out a little bit later in the presentation, but that's where it started getting interesting. These are the questions that were being asked at the inquiry. And, and in a nutshell, <coughs> um, one of the things that the tribunal found was that the, the register itself um, was, should not have been used. There was there was no um, checking of that data before it was used for the purpose of voting on that mandate. 
strategy. Um, there was also a petition against the, the uh, Whakatua Hand Hand Mandate strategy in November 2016, and that petition ended up being a crucial, um, a crucial element of evidence at the tribunal hearing. Um, it demonstrated very clearly how many people supported and how many people didn't with regard to the number of Y claimants. Um, and I'll, I'll show you that, um, that illustration shortly. The um, tribunal found that there were, regist there were deficiencies in the tribal register used by the trust board. And uh, the other compelling piece of evidence was um, the broadening the reach strategy, which no one knew about. Oh, yeah. And I'm gonna give you a quick little look at Sorry, Ember's so just figuring it all out. So <coughs> this is the broadening the reach document. And that's not an accident, it's black. <laughs> and it's black and it's still black and wait, there's a paragraph. And it says up, you know. Basically this highlights a strategy by the government of the day, who was national at the time. because um, you know, while we're sharing information, let's make sure it's right, eh? Yeah. The government of the day was the national party, the national government. They'd been in power for nine years, at, up to this point. So up to this point, they basically went, they had put together this document called Broadening the Reach. Um, and it basically is a political objective to get as many settlements done by 2020 as possible. That's right, yes. To just cut to the chase. Rather you know, than go through the blah blah. Hi, Auntie. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly. So this is what the judge got given, <coughs> and the tri and the tribunal panel. It's still black. You're not seeing things. Oh, another paragraph. Oh, there you go. It was Stephen Mason at the time. So this was this was released in 2016. But it took uh, the tribunal panel several attempts to get a copy. And this is what they got. You mean they got it? Really? Black. It's black. It's, black. it's redacted. So yes. basically, they black, it well, black, eh? blacked out chunk. Because yeah. um, lots of people talk about this document, but no one's actually showing it to anybody, I don't think. Mm. I could get into trouble, but we'll discuss that later, I'm not sure. 
Oh, we know nothing. <laughs> no, not likely, because it's actually been it's, it was submitted as evidence because oh. the crown were asked to give the tribunal a copy of that. So this is and still black, and and still black. So it was quite a okay. There's a little bit of information, not very much. Um, and then back to black. <coughs> Obviously, significant portions of that document have been deliberately blacked out, so we can't see it. And the uh, tribunal panel um, <coughs> essentially couldn't see it either. <coughs> and I dare say, at some point, they were probably being just about considered to be in contempt because they were asked for information without the redactions. And I don't. This this is what they got. That is sad. So I just want to um. And I know that, you know, really, uh, there's not a lot of information in there that's very helpful. But I just want to draw everyone's attention to the fact that these are all the people that got a hard copy of that what? document. Even the police. I answered. And the Minister of Māori Development. Oh, yeah. Just want to point that out. Amen. I'm not saying either one way or another, oh, fellas, gosh. kids, all grown up. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Figured that kind of help for yourselves, but not helpful when we um, our people are trying to move forward, oh. and that's all of the, the information that's what was going on in the background. So, so well, isn't it? um, as I said before, it's about sharing information. Thanks for sharing because it's caring. <laughs> yeah. This is a. <coughs> so this is the gov this is a um, illustration that was used as part of our uh, evidence, as part of Natita's evidence, um, which Tiriwhia actually put together, and it basically identifies. If you see here, our, the names of all our hapu, for Fakatoa here, and each of the hapu had their own um, claims lodged. Okay. So, what we've identified here is, and if we take um, Ngāti Ngāhere for example, okay, they've got two two Y claims, and one of the one of the Y claim uh, Y claimants, hundred percent supports the Fakatua here mandate strategy, but the other doesn't. So how they translate on the diagram under Ngāti Ngāhere that 50% are in favour of the mandate and the other 50% were not. Mm -hmm. So that that diagram was used to illustrate um, the manner in which we were able to gauge who was supported and who didn't. Um, we're just seeing the keys down there that the, that the information, the results are based on the claimants that had either formally lodged their claims before the Northeastern Bay of Plenty Inquiry um, have invoked the withdrawal mechanism, and that's that's a um, the withdrawal mechanism is around being able to take your claim out from underneath the uh, the pre settlement claims trust, um, or applied for urgent hearing, or formally stated uh, at an open hui that they objected or supported. So that's where all of that data came from. Um, and again. The information was this information was collated to identify um, who had invoked the withdrawal process and identify the number of Y claims who was in support. Is it more? Yeah. And so that gives a um, kind of a bigger picture of where, where the, the Y558 claim started and where we've got to now. So now we're up to the point where they've released the information about the report, or the, they've released the report. Um, and clearly Ngātira's position is that Ngātira speaks for Ngātira. Um, no one outside of Ngātira should be speaking to our claim. <coughs> The Marine and Coastal Area Act was invoked in 2011, or the Takatai Moana Act. 
essentially that was created to replace the Foreshore and Seabed Act. Um, so all, really all the government's done is taken it from one place and moved it to another and then tried to um, dilute our, our ability to represent our own interests. That's diplomatic enough. Um, for those of us that don't understand the, the relationship, <coughs> I've never, to, to this point, I've only come across it even one person who couldn't understand why you've got to have mana moana to have, uh, sorry, why you need to have mana whenua to have mana moana. So to put it in simple terms, unless you are a fish, you need to have some whenua with your moana or your awa running through it in order to have mana moana. The two are integral, like all things. Um, so Nartida's uh, lodged an application uh, in 2017 to the High Court um, and in April the application was publicly notified by way of a, a public notice in the newspaper. Um, in the same month, the Whakatuahia Māori Trust Board submitted an application for all hapu of Whakatuahia and I'd like to um, just highlight at that point, <clears throat> although the trust board submitted their application for the hapu, a number of trustees were not actually aware that that had been done until afterward, when it appeared in the newspaper. In the same month, um, the Nartina reps on the trust board, how myself and Robin, we advised the Whakatuhia Trust Board that we had in fact already lodged our own uh, MACA claim and we instructed the Trust Board uh, MACA application be amended to exclude Nātida. Then we asked again in June um, and then we established our own trust in July of 2017, which is registered with the Charities Commission. In August, and again in November, we asked the Trust Board again to amend its application. And then on December of last year, uh, we were approved by OTS for funding uh, to support our MACA application, Nazis. <coughs> For those of us that don't know, um, the traditional boundaries of Mātātua extend from uh, across um, Mainākuria, Whare, Kitehira. So um, from Whare near Katikati all the way down to Tehire Ngā Mūrewai. And there are a number of applications that have been submitted for the same area. So this is the, um, the Whakatua Hea Rohe Moana which can see stretches from Raitotara all the way down to um, Opape. And Nātida's customary interests, so this means these, are, these are areas that we used to fish, trade, um, gather kai. Aurohimwana includes um, interests in Te Moana Taurongo, the Odua Haba, um, Waiotahi and Waiweka River and Waiotahi and Hikuwai beaches. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Kerati Pōpō being a trader, those are the areas where you can just go and trade with our whānau and others. <coughs> so the traditional um, boundaries as we already identified, um, Ngā Tira have, it's, we've always used We've always practiced our customary rights there. We've always practiced our kaitakatanga. Um, and that's included things like gathering <coughs> kaimana, um, landing of waka, recreational use, designation of rahu, wahitapu, um, and generally exercising our kaitakatanga and, and um, mana moana. <coughs> our rohe moana is integral to our identity as Ngāti Ra and the cultural and spiritual practices of kaitiakitanga over our mana moana 
the assertion of our mana whakahairia of tikana and kawa, the intrinsic ties and ongoing relationships we have to our neighbouring hapu and iwi, um, all of which contribute to our aurana tiratanga and mana motu hapu. Our livelihood and survival as a hapu of Ngā Tira has always been focal around um, our, our awa and our moana. So 190 applications have gone into the High Court and because of the, the huge number of applications, the Attorney General proposed that they get put into 21 groups and our maker claim has been grouped into Group I. And that's Group I there. This whole stretch of area from here <coughs> across to here. All of those dots all over the map, those are everybody else's applications as well. So from 94 to 103, those are the, the application numbers, if you like. That the, we've all been grouped into that section there. So all of these people, all of our people, have said we've all got the same customary interest boundaries. So it's a shared interest, you know, no one owns anything, but we all share an interest in the same area because we've all gathered kai, we've all traded in the same area. Um, and what's gotten interesting is that um, <clears throat> with the application that was lodged by Uncle Claude uh, some years back, Natita's interest have been, uh, if you like, have been given the same priority because they're related to their application. So when their application is ready to be heard, the court will also want to hear ours because it's all tied up together. So since we established the trust, we've identified um, three different work streams. The first is the um, Takutai Moana Working Committee, which is led by myself. Our uh, oral and traditional research, which will be led by uh, Papa Te Rua, Uncle Roger, and the technical research, which is going to be led by Te Ringahuya. So where we are essentially at this point is that the MAC funding was applied for and approved in 2017. Um, we have commissioned a researcher and this year uh, focusing on compiling um, all of our information which once we've got the draft ready will be presented back to our hapu and um, a preliminary hearing start in June this this June coming so that's when all the lawyers will have to go and meet with the judge and have a discussion about you know how that information is going to be presented <clears throat> so, <clears throat> the summary of the Waitangi Tribunal Whakatoha Mandate Inquiry Report. Please bear with me. Did you play any pathways while we switch over to the next? <laughs> You're sitting there really well behaved. Yeah. So, so even though um, in the mandating process for the um, takuto, they've released Natiidas or, or they've given the like the claimant back to use, but have to still go under Fakato here or like the the main drive of the. They'll, they'll travel time. together, Cass, rather than not under. Oh, yes, together. so you travel together, yeah. but you'll still be on your own? Correct. This is... I can't so see so by right. going, being on your own, you get to dictate, or, or you, even though there's the lawyers and that, but you... You get to say what you want, not what Fakatoya. Yeah. Like, um, no. you have a say, you don't have to go 
this and will be under what Whakatoa here puts? Correct. No, don't question it. The, the yeah. Ngātira Ai. So the Ngātira Mana Moana application was lodged by Papaterua on behalf of Ngātira. If we sort of go back a little bit to the... Um, there is some kōrero at the moment <coughs> that I've heard about... Um, There's an inference, if you like, that the white claimants are not necessarily supported. Put that as diplomatically as I can. Are not necessarily supported by our people, by our hapu. That although they are carrying the claim on behalf of our hapu, they don't necessarily have the support of our hapu. Um, it's crucial that people wrap their head around that because there's a lot of kōrero about oh, there's some of us are travelling too past that's kai te pai people will, will form the opinions and the um, you know, they'll come to the decisions that, that, they, that they think is right for them and that, that's, there's nothing wrong with that I myself I don't have that conflict there's the Y558 and at the hui that I attended, regardless of the fact that it was by video link, a number of my whanau from Ngātira showed up to the trust board and they totoko papaturua. For me, and the way that I was raised, that's it. There is no two paths. There's just that path. So, like I said, everyone's adults. We can all make our own decision. But for... My generation and the way we grew up, <coughs> no doubt some of you are older. For us, rangatira tanga is about your rangatira. So you can either have a rangatira over there that's driven by several people, or you actually have your own rangatira who's carrying the mandate from our hapu. For me, that, that's a kind of a no-brainer. I'm not confused about that at all. Um, and that's just the way that I was raised. That's all I know. <coughs> so for me it's you know um, it's about as clear cut as that for others they have different views that's play too that's fine I don't, I don't you know don't give anything to say on, on that matter I can only you know, I can only say the claim was um, passed from Uncle John to Papa Terua, and with that responsibility also came the mana moana application because it's as I say mana whenua mana moana they, you, you can't separate those two things. The information from the report that we're going to put up on the screen now, <clears throat> I need to be very clear, is not an interpretation of what was in the report. It's actually taken straight out of the report. Okay, so these are not my words or the lawyer's words. These are the words of the tribunal, just so we're clear. Okay. It's not Amber's gone and pulled out a dictionary and made up all this awesome stuff that no one understands. It's actually from the court. Which is <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> and there's quite a bit of us. So we'll try and walk everyone through it um, as best we can. It's very wordy. Uh, kind of, that's what happens when you're dealing with courts and tribunal reports. They're very lengthy. And the language is not very friendly sometimes. <laughs> So the first part I is, um, was the Crown's recognition of the pre-settlement claims trust mandate fair, reasonable and made in good faith? That's the question from the tribunal. Okay. So the tribunal's primary finding is that the Crown's recognition of the mandate was not fair, reasonable and made in good faith. The Crown placed its political objective of concluding settlements by mid-2020 over a process that was fair to Whakatoa here. The tribunal's view is that the Crown lost sight of its treaty um, settlement principles, and the tribunal noted process of reaching settlement still requires the exercise of care and a reasonable response to the concerns raised by hapu and claimants, why claimants. Whakatoa here required more than a fast tracking of picking and backing the group considered by the Crown as the most likely to achieve a quick settlement. 
The tribunal also found process lacked balance and adequate protections and strongly implied a predetermined outcome. So before we even got to vote, it had already, that there was that inference that there was already a predetermined outcome. Those in opposition to the mandate have good reason to feel that their concerns were not given a fair hearing. Another question, should the Crown have relied on the Whakatua Hea Trust Board Register? The tribunal noted Crown appeared to pay very little attention to this issue, and Crown witnesses could not explain the discrepancy of approximately 3,000 between those registered and those sent voting packs. The tribunal found that it was not reasonable for the Crown to rely on the Trust Board Register for the purposes of the mandate vote. Was the Crown sufficiently informed about levels of support and opposition? The tribunal identified two aspects to this. The first is that the fact that the Crown did not insist on a process that would enable Whakatua here to indicate support or opposition on a hapu basis. Okay, it was done by person, by our individual votes. The reason why that's important is because the treaty is based on hapu rangatiratanga. Number two, contemporary expressions of support and opposition to the mandate in 2016 suggest that levels of support and opposition were more finely balanced than the Crown allows. So the Crown, in fact, yeah, well, it speaks for itself, really, doesn't it? The Tribunal noted that the Crown played down the indication of opposition relative support for the mandate was overstated and opposition was understated. <coughs> the potential risk was downplayed and, and officials advised against waiting for the outcome of the petition that was lodged in November 2016. You know the one that I tagged you all in? Yeah, that one. <laughs> the tribunal's view was that all these factors point to a process and lines of advice shaped to meet political expectations centred on accelerating settlements. The tribunal did not see evidence of due care and attention being paid to the expression of opposition and found that the Crown did not sufficiently inform itself of the levels of support or opposition to the mandate. Was there sufficient support to warrant mandate recognition? Evidence the Crown relied on to assess support was both insufficient and unreliable. The Tribunal were concerned about the adequacy and reliability of information conveyed to Ministers, as participation and support figures were overstated and opposition understated, because there was no proper assessment of the state of the Trust Board Register, which goes back to your question. Yeah. And, and the key there too, like uh, Finlayson's caused all this shit in Barona or Tauraki. Aye. And um, what we're doing with that is making them accountable because they talk to the people that they'll get a yes from. They won't talk to the masses, like, like we're saying here. Yeah. So so that, that issue with Hauraki and Barona Moana was caused by <coughs> Finlayson talking to an individual without following due process, which is what you're going through here, mm -hmm. signing it all, and then it's come back to kick in the ass because we didn't know about it. Or mm. was it certain individuals? So mm -hmm. they talk to the people who they'll get a yes from mm. to hurry up the process. Oh. So in August 17, <coughs> Mason and John Key for four national talked about, they, they had a mandate to get it all sorted before them mm -hmm. so that they could push the envelope. Oh. This is where all these issues are coming. And Finlayson is the main problem, like um, Tariana, oh, Nanai, no, she was at our hui we had, oh, and I oh, got yeah. to have a few words with her, and they're not dumb. They know that there's skullduggery going on. Mm -hmm. That's the word we use, skullduggery. It's not deficiency, yeah. it's constant. Yeah, fair enough. I think essentially what, what's happening at the, at the moment is that the Labour, Labour um, government is, they're having to do a bit of a yeah. mop up. Essentially, um, they've inherited a uh, bit of a mess, and I guess they're going to try and work through it as best they can. Um, 
which to date is good news for the rest of us who have, you know, especially, especially when we have outcomes like this. So this is completely independent from both parties. Yeah. Um, and the, the information that's come back from the tribunal, um, it's, that's huge. It's, it's huge. It's um, very rare that you get this kind of substantive report that clearly points to the Crown and says, actually, no, you didn't follow process. And, and if you look at the Crown behalf, the problem like we could sort it out is come on the mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than to be overthinking it now. Like everyone's got a channel to come in and say, hey, 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 what's going on here? That's right. But if you look at what Finlay says, Fun and John Key, they've started all this. Mm -hmm. It's a divide and conquer process that they are uh, right around. And I think that's really critical. We have to make sure we remember. The crown, <coughs> the crown process is the crown process. It's not ours. It's not ours. No, I'll put it on top. Exactly. And what they've said is, here's your bus. We know it's broken, but too bad. <laughs> That's your bus. So you use your bus. They've changed okay. the lock twice. They bought until we put them on it first. Mm -hmm. I've waited and died. And it was just, it didn't work. So they had to go back to the drawing board, come back with a whole new idea without our input, and say, you fellas follow this. As if you do, it will divide and conquer you. We'll divide you. We'll use disagreement better. Yeah, exactly. And it always is going to come back to, and I think we always have to recognise that the general agreement, the general consensus is that yes, we do want settlement. But the way that that settlement comes about is a whole other different quarter. And, you know, some third party doesn't have the right to decide that for us. We need to be having those discussions yeah. amongst ourselves. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, like for us, it's about the, the disrespect for the money I'm protecting. Um, you know, we're not actually talking about the money. Mm -hmm. actually, you know, we want our land back. You just keep your money sticking. And we want an apology and make sure everything's done right and acknowledged. Mm -hmm. and that's all, that's all we want. But well, I think heart. if we're honest, actually, there's some of us, that is, well, for some of us, it is about the money. Oh, you know, mm. for some of us, no the reality mm. is, we're trying to feed our kids, we're trying to house our whanau, you know, we've got people sleeping the in bangs, yep. and that's inexcusable. The problem with this process, though, is that we only get one crack at it, so if we don't get it right, we can't go back and fix it later. Yeah, Crown rules. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's been a huge steep learning curve for a number of us, I guess, <laughs> So the tribunal found that basically when you put together all of the effects and the you know inadequacy um, identified, that it was unsafe for the Crown to conclude in December 2016 that there was sufficient support for the Crown. <coughs> the Crown can't point to the mandate vote and express confidence in the outcome as the particip participation rate was low. <coughs> And there's um, considerable room for uh, ambiguity, so it's open to interpretation and argument over the true levels of support. The Crown's decision to prioritise Whakatoa here for the 2017 negotiations timetable and to start work prior to the mandate itself being recognised gives rise to a significant risk that the outcome is predetermined. The tribunal found, and for me this is what a major, the tribunal found that the Crown breached its treaty partnership obligations. I'm going to say it one more time. The Crown breached its treaty partnership obligations by failing to adequately assess the level of support for the Whakatohia mandate. For those of us who are still learning about this, the treaty is the document that all of this is based on. Start breaching that, and you haven't got much left. Mm -hmm. So, who is the tribunal? Um, in this in this particular hearing, uh, we had Judge Dugan, Judge Michael Dugan, <coughs> uh, who is a Māori Land Court judge, and um, there were three other members of the panel. Am I? Yes. Yeah. Jointly. Um, <laughs> Did the crowd?
background, consider reasonable alternative mandate instructions. The tribunal noted that once the Crown began to view Tuake as the only serious contender for the mandate, it became increasingly difficult for those in opposition to be heard. Tribunal remains doubtful that the Crown gave more than a passing consideration to any alternative mandate instructions. And the tribunal did not make any specific findings on this issue. The withdrawal mechanism. So, <coughs> basically, under the Whakatuli of Free Settlement Claims Trust, if you wanted to um, take the claim out, the way claim, they had a, a what they call a withdrawal mechanism. The tribunal found that the withdrawal mechanism was not fair, and it needs to be corrected. The tribunal identified several problems with the pre settlement claims trust withdrawal mechanism, which makes it unfair and unworkable. The tribunal found that the withdrawal mechanism failed to clearly set out a process by which individual hapu can withdraw from the pre settlement claims trust deed of mandate. This compounds the problem created by the lack of information about which hapu agreed to the deed of mandate in the first place. So again, if we go back to Hapu Rangi Siratanga, okay, that whole voting system was wrapped around one man, one vote. Not which Hapu is in support and which Hapu is in opposition. The Crown's decision to continue to recognise the mandate. The tribunal's finding was that the Crown should not have recognised the pre-settlement claims mandate when it did. In the summary of findings, findings, the tribunal identified that the Crown prioritised its political objective of concluding treaty settlements by mid-2020 over a process that was fair to Whakatohia. Whakatohia was included in the broadening the reach strategy and given priority in the 2017 <coughs> negotiation timetable, even though substantial divisions were apparent. So although we're at one another's throats by that point, they still didn't care. The decision to recognise the pre-settlement claims trust mandate was not fair, was not reasonable and was not made in good faith and breaches the treaty principle of the partnership. The Crown breached the principle of active protection by relying on the Trust Board Register for the purposes of the mandate vote. The Crown failed to inform itself of the adequacy of the Register and to ensure steps were taken to update the Register before the mandate vote was taken. The Crown did not sufficiently inform itself of the true levels of support and opposition to the Pre-Settlement Claims Trust mandate prior to recognition and breach of the principle of active protection. The Crown failed to act reasonably to ensure an adequate means of voting on the mandate on a hapu basis and breach of the principle of active protection. The Crown failed to act reasonably in approving a mandate containing a withdrawal mechanism it knew to be unfair and breach of the principle of active protection. The wire claims the Crown included in the deed of mandate fell short of treaty requirements of good faith conduct and the principle of partnership. Mm. <laughs> well, and this is, you know, um, none of us wants to sit and read 120 pages of stuff we don't understand. One breach is enough, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the so the idea yeah. was to try and condense, you know, take those parts out that were relevant and share it so that our whānau get a better understanding of what the tribunal's report says, basically. Broadening the reach strategy. The Crown's decision to withhold the key document, broadening the reach, which you all saw earlier, you know, the big black pages, <laughs> that one. <laughs> <coughs> until a reference to the strategy emerged in response to questions from Claimant Council, actually, and Sykes, I'm gonna just plug 